Cool. So, um, so thanks for coming, everybody. Uh, this is informal, and I know Jared had a, a family slideshow. So I'm I'm not having a family slideshow, but uh, this is super chill and relaxed. So if you guys have any questions, um, please just unmute and just interrupt me and stop me with, with whatever I'm saying or, or what have you. Um, and we can go from there. Um, unless Donna needs to say anything or I assume we're good. Okay, cool. All right, you guys. So, um, so thank you. I also uh, uh, broke my foot last night. So, um, so I'm trying to attempt to have my foot elevated. Uh, so because there's not enough to do in COVID land, we apparently have to have more self-inflicted self wounds as possible. Um, anyway, so cool. So, um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna get going. Let me share my screen. Uh, unless people have some questions before we get going, but other than that, we can get going. Okay, cool. So thanks everybody. I'm gonna I'm gonna make your screens a little bit smaller so I'm not I can see my whole screen, and uh, and again just. Uh, yell at me and ask me, oh, there's something in the chat. Is there something important in the chat? Um, oh, okay, cool, no, no, no stress. All right, you guys, so I wanna talk about what I've been um, working on and, uh, and things that have been inspired by the long-term research we've been doing, my, my colleagues and I have been doing, but also by the developments of the pandemic. Um, we, we have to be careful when we say things can't get worse. <laughs> Because they always seem to be able to get worse, uh, and and uh, indeed many points in the last eighteen months, I think many of us have have felt this, and this has been a a real thing. So if you do need to leave, if you do need to, uh, uh, if it just gets worse and you have to bail out or whatever, or I put you to sleep, these are my key takeaways uh, from um, my uh, recent uh, thinking and and discussing with many of you. Um, first is that uh, beaches are really energetic places. Um, we knew this uh, historically, but we've kind of forgotten that. But they're they're both energetically in an ecological, natural sciences type of way. But I would also argue they're very energetically socially, and they're very important for our our communities um, in a whole variety of of contexts. Um, I think we have a we here at CSUCI um, bring a huge value in terms of looking at uh, problems in a new way, particularly with our interdisciplinary approaches. And um, I, I really want to encourage our, my younger colleagues, my older colleagues, we really have to continually blow on that flame to keep interdisciplinarity going. It's just so easy, especially now in pandemic and all the other stresses, it's easier um, for us to uh, just kind of by default retreat into our disciplinary um, silos. And, um, and, and I, th I think we lose a lot when that happens, um, not just our campus, but, but we lose a lot. So, so there's true value in that interdisciplinary thinking and, and approaches to stuff. COVID-19 is amounted to a natural experiment. And in some cases, um, this is, uh, may well be a forecast for what our future looks like. Um, and, and hopefully that can scare us in some context. In some cases that, that, that can bring us comfort, in other cases that maybe can scare us into behaving differently or engaging uh, differently. Um, and uh, a whole suite of tools right now, uh, uh, Dan and Kiki have a fantastic new grant, um, which is sort of building off of these ideas, but going, but doing things in their own way and building off of their own scholarship. And, and there's a whole host of powerful tools we're increasingly bringing to play um, to answer some of these uh, more sophisticated questions. And then lastly, again, if you have to leave, uh, this is an invitation to collaborate. So I, I really um, uh, cherish uh, my collaborations with you all. And, and I hope that uh, some of you that I've not collaborated with professionally, um, that maybe after this, we can have a, a libation or two when, when my foot can be somewhere other than propped up and we can um, uh, talk about ways of collaborating, either continuing these ideas or maybe some new ones. And, uh, and again, just in summary, I think we, we've learned that the coronavirus closures really afforded us a unique uh, way to interrogate our coastal systems. Okay, so let's get into it. So, sorry, did you have a question? No, okay. So um, uh, in thinking about, uh, so, so my sabbatical was happening when coronavirus hit. And so, um, so these thoughts and, and, and things I'm gonna share today are both from that time and also bled into this past year. So this is, this is sabbatical plus some stuff that I'm gonna talk about. But one of the things that, that I've been thinking about a lot is this notion of the so-called 
California imaginary, or at least what, what uh, uh, some of us have coined the term California imaginary. And that is this notion that um, beaches in particular, Southern California beaches um, in, in particular, particular, um, really um, have powerful cultural capital, but a particular cultural capital. And we, through our, our, the media prowess of Southern California, we've really helped define how much of the world um, interprets beaches in the coast and also our beaches in our coast. And that was through things like Beach Blanket Bingo. Um, up there on the right, it was a huge movie productions that would go on for, that went on for a couple decades at Point Magoo here in Ventura County, where our beaches were transformed into all these different um, beaches across the world for, for silent films and then for, for um, a, a, current, a current era of films and, and on and on. So we have this California imaginary. And that's often how um, uh, people implicitly and explicitly have thought about our beaches. And oftentimes that's very white and oftentimes that's very affluent and oftentimes that's, that's sort of a, a narrow subset of society that is portrayed there. New impressions are emerging. And so I would say we're currently in, or, or we have been in for a bit, this, this uh, not the California imaginary, but maybe what I'm calling the California dystopiary, right? So this period where um, these beaches, yes, are still iconic. Yes, they, they get covered in the national news and all this and that, um, but they really represent um, uh, bad things. They represent um, um, the flip side of paradise and all and on and on and on. So for example, here is during the Woolsey fire on the upper left, these are some llamas out at the, and, and toy and um, um, miniature horses out at Zuma beach, because that's the only place so they can go. It looks like lectures, we, we thought this was project. They, uh, um, I also, I want us to be very careful about some oh, sorry, of these, I gotta, I gotta about how also. we approach the mission Where pillars. Hey, I think you're, I think you're unmuted moment, or something. The only, there is, Liz King, the I only think. reason a student in our, in our right. history would be guaranteed to Can meet you please community, mute? Thank you. Uh, community engagement learning outcome is if. Excellent. Okay, cool. Um, awesome. Thanks, you guys. Uh, where was I? I was over here. Um, da, 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 da. Oh, yes. Yeah, so, okay, so. So um, all, all these weird, crazy scenes, when that when we first got these pictures from the Woolsey fire, it was like, oh my God, I thought this looks like Blade Runner and I better get some pictures because it's gonna disappear. And then of course, uh, last year with the fires around the San Francisco Bay area, and now this, we know this to be a normal, a normal image, but uh, just disturbingly normal image. But, but this notion of just weirdness, there's an oil spill up there from the 2015 Refugio spill. There's these surfers here on the uh, lower right during the Thomas fire, you know, the classic surfers, but now these guys are wearing half mask respirators because the air quality was so bad, um, uh, they couldn't uh, go on and it goes on and on. So this notion of um, dysfunction in the beach as, as a place of, of fear and concern and, and unease. Um, but then I would say, um, the, okay, yeah, right. So th this is last week, or this is, sorry, this is two weeks ago. So this is a little quick drone flight. This is by Point Doom. Um, so this is uh, Malibu coast. And we're looking down initially at a destroyed house. Ad. So this was a um, big giant mansion that was destroyed by the, um, by the Woolsey fire. Fire came from Simi Valley, ran to the coast, came to the coast. Um, it, it, if you're in Simi Valley, right, and you try to get to Malibu, it's about a 45 minute drive. Um, the fire got to the Malibu coast in about an hour and 45 minutes, um, at least some of the first flames and some of the first embers. So um, we, oh, the fire was going almost as fast as, um, as we can drive. And so that can be really scary. So this place of refuge can sometimes come to be seen as a place of, of danger and fear. Okay, so this is, we're looking down. So um, Zoom is to the right and we're turning left to look at uh, Point Doom. This area is now all closed. There, there's some yellow caution tape. This road is not accessible. This road started to fall into the ocean three weeks ago. So this road that has been here for uh, several decades is, um, is, is eroding out. It's eroding out because of some of the practices of these wealthy landowners on the left, but it's also eroding out because of sea level rise and all of these um, ongoing challenges. This is the kind of thing you would expect to see 
perhaps in the middle of a big winter storm, not in the middle of um, you know, uh, calm summertime conditions. And so, um, so this was a, 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 a unusual swell that came in and it was banging, but what we're looking at in the lower right, now we're armoring the coast. Now you can't access the beach and that whole area there that just below us right here, the roadway has been carved out and um, the concrete is falling into the ocean. So the California dystopiary. Um, and, and here's some data from Dan. Dan's on the line, Dan and Kiki. Um, just one little quick, ex quick example. This is from a slide uh, from a talk I gave a couple weeks ago, but, but um, basically uh, this is their work looking at what would be lost when sea level rise continues. So we're gonna lose all kinds of recreational facilities, access, et cetera. And they're working on um, bringing this work to um, closer to home here in Ventura County. So you can stay tuned and, and, and check in with those guys for more details on that. But okay, so so the imaginary, the, the then we moved into this sort of crazy dysfunction time or scary time. And what I what I think might be happening is we're on the edge of another phase of our understanding and relationship with our coast, and that's the California inclusionary, what, what I'm calling the California inclusionary. So there's a whole variety of things that we can talk about, but. But um, perhaps the, the most high profile event um, is what's going on um, now in Manhattan Beach. So Manhattan Beach, uh, uh, one of the beach cities in Los Angeles County, a classic place that is viewed as, as relatively not diverse, incredibly wealthy, um, you know, hard to get. You have to have at least 2.5 kids and at least two golden retrievers and have a big, huge mug for your Starbucks to even be allowed into the city, it seems like at times. Um, but this area, was uh, first, um, uh, in terms of the modern era, was first developed um, as a place of, um, uh, a, 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 a developed in the early 1900s when people didn't go to the beach a whole lot. So this is a Dooney area, this is a Rolly area. And essentially some de developers got the idea, hey, maybe we can actually put some houses here, et cetera. And so this started going in. Um, and uh, in addition to just sort of regular folks going there, um, and and people having homes. Some people started setting up some vacation type of type of facilities there. And so one of those was the Bruce family, and they were an African American family. And so they established a little area that was both uh, you could buy buy um, cabins or buy property, but also it was a, um, a vacation type of rental, vacation type of situation. And so that was and, and it and it operated for a while and was very popular with the African American community who were oftentimes excluded from access to beach and other public resources um, uh, at the time. Um, and things were kind of humming along. And then um, the developer said, oh, hey, we want this land too. And we don't want these guys there. So they used eminent domain um, to take this property from this African-American family. And uh, now this place, if you've been to um, if you've been to Manhattan Beach, this is, uh, if you're driving through the main part of the town, there's, there's uh, uh, buildings, 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 buildings. Then you get to this one area where it's just this long rolling hill of grass and uh, that, that is the, the current headquarters, the regional headquarters for Baywatch, the lifeguards. And, um, and that, that's their property. Um, and it was hugely problematic for the family. For many years, they, they attempted to, to fight this and et cetera. It caused lots of division amongst the family members. And it was a very stressful thing. And, and, and most sort of gave up. But a small contingent kept lobbying, kept lobbying, kept lobby, lobby, lobbying. And by the late 90s, they were starting to get some purchase. By the early 2000s, um, they uh, were getting more purchase. And um, they eventually put in this little, or they get established this little monument here to Bruce's Beach to historically commemorate the African-American community that used to be there. Um, everything about this has been hard and challenging. Even the wording on the plaque it, it took, took a long time to, um, to work up, et cetera. Um, but where we are now is, and so, so the thought was, okay, we have a memorial plaque or something. And some folks thought that was the best we could do. Where we are now is it's continuing, the momentum is continuing to burl um, forward. Um, and particularly in the wake of the George Floyd um, um, unrest, uh, uh, this has gotten additional momentum. So where we are now is um, the county, the, the supervisors for the county of Los Angeles are working on um, legislation the state of Cal representatives, uh, elected representatives in, in the legislature for California are changing some laws. And the idea is we're, we're trying to give back this now publicly owned land to this family. Um, and so that is, it's, it's, it takes a long time, it's very hard, but that is a huge step. Um, uh, 
when we were doing our annual uh, count, our synoptic count this year, it just happened to be on Juneteenth, massive party in this uh, a festival of music, all kinds of stuff in this park. This was my survey region. So I was down there, um, really cool. Saw more African-American folks at the beach than I have ever, ever seen in a single day uh, in Manhattan Beach in like 35, 35 years or so. So so really cool. So there's all kinds of signs <laughs> happening. We are not we are not a perfect society by any means, but there's all kinds of signs that we're, we're actively becoming more inclusive in our coastal zone, or at least working towards that. Um, there's black girls surf, there's all kinds of different groups. Um, it is far from perfect, however. So in the middle picture here is, is a, a tour I was helping um, to lead this summer with um, Pacoima Beautiful, which is a, um, a group in the uh, San Fernando Valley that, that uh, environmental justice group. And we were bringing folks, uh, his, um, mostly Spanish speaking families, mostly folks at uh, low income that don't have easy access to vehicles. We were bringing them to the beach for the day, showing their kids the beach, all that great stuff. Um, super awesome, families loved it. Great, uh, awesome thing. They were looking at their public resource. And then on the upper right, um, the sheriffs came. So some of the wealthy landowners around the beach um, saw people that uh, didn't look like them. And so they thought it was appropriate to call the sheriff and the sheriff thought it was appropriate to come out and observe and park and just stare and watch uh, these uh, families. So we are not inclusive yet, but we are making strides. And, and, um, and the Pacoima Beautiful group has, this has only redoubled their effort to continue to bring folks, introduce people to the beach and our coast um, and be more engaged. So, so I, I, I think we're somewhere on this arc um, of, of the California imaginary has been evolving. Um, okay, when we talk about, uh, let me see, this seems a little hard to read. Let me move that. Okay, there we go. Um, when we talk about uh, what's been going on recently um, with regards to these things about, about inclusion and, and all this and that, I think um, sometimes there's, there's less apparent engagement of um, the natural resources um, in the media that is actually happening in fact. And so, so the rhetoric about, we're sort of, I would think, I believe that we've been so um, raised in this notion of the California imaginary, who should go to the beach, who should utilize the beach, um, that we, um, th that, that we uh, bake that into our uh, initial thinking of, of media coverage and on and on and on. So for example, um, when, we, when we talked about um, pandemic homestay um, and, and, the, and, and what does this do and, and, and how is it impacting things, um, uh, certain things came up. So the notion of that, that certain wealthy folks could go utilize the beach or when we had beach closures, most people couldn't go to the beach, but the wealthy folks, the privileged folks at the coast, they could go ahead and walk on the beach, even though the signs say, you know, don't, don't come here. Um, and and I, I think of one example uh, when uh, we had a, a closure, one of the beaches we were monitoring um, and uh, two relatively wealthy gentlemen uh, ran on, I, actually a couple of families uh, came up and said, hey, can we, can we um, uh, uh, use the beach? And they said, oh no, the beach is closed. And they said, okay, we're really sorry. And they, they moved on and they, they went down the coast to find another pocket of beach. These two wealthy guys came out jogging. They ran up to the same individual who was, who was um, acting as an information officer at the beach. And uh, this was at, at Zuma Beach in Malibu. And, uh, they, and they started running on the beach. And the guy said, oh, sorry, the beaches are closed right now. You can't use the beach. And they said, and the exact quote was, oh, come on, man, it's me. And the guy just ran right past, the two guys ran right past the gentleman and just kept on going. So, so that notion of some folks feel entitled, some folks feel the rules don't apply to them, some folks feel um, that, uh, that, that this resource is, is only theirs and that they can go to the resort towns to work, et cetera. So as a consequence, some, some of the rhetoric came out that people that were using the beach um, were or somehow jerks or somehow mean or somehow selfish. Um, and we have some of these you know, images like this that were coming out where it's sort of uh, idealized, um, almost fetishized ways of thinking about engaging with the coast. Um, and we started to see articles like this. So this article is from um, March of 20, uh, uh, 2020 uh, about you know, people going to the beach. And, and this was very common where, you know, what are these idiots doing on the beach? What are these idiots doing? If there's a pandemic, they should be locked home and away. Um, but, uh, 
but that something else is going on here. So yes, there were some silly folks that weren't socially distancing, et cetera. But what we saw is this huge interest in the coast. And so when folks could not go to their local park because things were closed, when people couldn't go to their gyms and, and their other places to recreate, um, people really rediscovered redis and or rediscovered the coast. And so this is um, um, Deer Creek. So this is on PCH. This is in Ventura County, uh, the Ventura County part of the coast and huge numbers of cars here. So let me just click this. So we're here at uh, Deer Creek and there's the road Deer Creek. Um, huge increases in people attending beaches. Um, so I just counted 67 people on the beach and there were 160 cars inside of the road here. So, so um, 67 people on the beach, 160 cars. You, you can't quite tell in this one, this part of the video I've just shown you, but up to the right, cars are parked up a half mile up that road. Um, uh, this was a beach that people used before the pandemic, but you know, th this time of year, springtime, you would see 20 cars there, you know, 25 cars. You'd never see 160 vehicles parked. So um, this story wasn't really covered, right? The story was, was always about it's dangerous, it's bad going to the beach. But this was really, I, I believe, um, that this was really evidenced of how interested people are in the coast and how valuable this area is to everyone, not just the wealthy folks, but everybody. <laughs> Um, and this is this is not just me thinking that. This is a paper that came out earlier this year from some folks at, um, at Dartmouth. Um, and what they found is that the rhetoric in American media news outlets in particular was quite negative, generally speaking, about COVID. So about 90% of all the articles were negative. Danger, going outside is a risk, all this and that. Compared to international media organizations, it was more, more evenly split in terms of some of the articles were scary and negative and bad and others were, hey, there's some upsides, you're able to spend some more time with your family, et cetera. So the rhetoric of the coast is, is a whole interesting thing. Okay, um, any questions so far about any of that? No, I've wowed everybody, perfect. Um, okay, so uh, just a, a quick primer. I wasn't sure who was going to come here today. So um, just a little bit of uh, stepping back and, and some, some background context. Um, uh, I'm an ecologist by training. I'm a biologist by training. Um, early uh, biologists uh, really started to interrogate the natural world by doing experiments, and experiments are hard. So initially, having a really complex system to look at is a difficult thing to do, and so we really didn't like that. And so we love simplified systems. So this is one of my old professors, Joe Connell, who's one of the fathers of modern quantitative ecology. And he started, he was in Scotland, uh, uh, living in Scotland in World War II, war, uh, you know, it was, it was in the military, um, stationed on a radar, what would, be, what would become a radar base, originally a weather station. And uh, finished up and said, I'm gonna go to grad, I'm gonna go to school. So he w w goes to college, decides he's gonna get his PhD and wants to study something, he decides to study rabbits. He's like, rabbits are cool. I love rabbits. Rabbits will be fun. He studied rabbits for a year and he said it sucked. It was horrible. Rabbits run away. They're very fast. They're hard to catch. So he invented what we now know as Joe Connell's rule of thumb, which is you should never study a critter larger than the size of your thumb. And so solely because of that, he turned his attention to the inner tidal, started doing some experiments. And this has become the classic example of, for example, competition that you see in our, in our um, introductory textbooks. And it spurred a whole generation and multiple generations of researchers that thought the coast is a great place to do research, but the rocky intertidal, the hard um, coast, because it's simplified and it's easy to do experiments. Um, and he worked on these, these barnacles, Balanus and Tham Thamelus. And generally speaking, ecologists don't love the sandy beach, don't love these, these, these wide open swaths because they're dynamic and they're hard to move in, they're hard to manipulate, they're hard to do stuff with, but, but we can do a lot of neat things. Um, for example, this is, these are uh, Pacific sand crabs that, that um, we've done a lot with, my colleagues have done a lot with, our students have done a lot with, and this is sort of like the, uh, the white lab rat of sandy beaches and, and the foundation of a lot of our ecosystem here where um, they're the food for fish, they're the food for birds, um, and they live right in the swash zone, but we can learn all kinds of cool stuff from them. So this is my son who's now a freshman. Uh, we dropped him off in college last to college last week, took him to college last week. Um, and he's uh, doing some dissections. So this is not high tech. Anybody could do this. These, these are really um, neat systems. But 
um, they can tell us some interesting things. So they can, by looking at this one little teeny part of a system that people thought was hard to study, we can actually get insights as to the bird populations, how many birds are around by looking at the parasite loads inside of these crabs and, and all kinds of neat stuff, which I'm not gonna talk about today, but they're very helpful for predicting what's going on. Um, what we've come to realize, and I'd say what, what we've come to realize, especially here at Channel Islands over the last 20 years or so, is really um, uh, that the dynamics of the beach is often uh, a betwixt and between situation. So we're, we're not terrestrial, we're not oceanic, we're in this mixing zone, um, socially, ecologically, um, for a whole variety of reasons. And, and there's all kinds of interesting presses and pulses that, that happen here. Um, we normally think of certain things like those sand crabs or like kelp rack here, which is deposited on the beach. Um, um, but increasingly, these systems, um, increasingly these systems uh, can be perturbed and we can um, have all kinds of other neat and interesting insights from disturbances that we're not used to. Um, and, the, and here's an example of PCH during um, uh, the, uh, the Woolsey fire whenever it was evacuating and everything was going to hell in a handbag it, basket. And so we uh, do this with a variety of methods, traditional social science methods, drones, all kinds of things. All of this is, uh, comes together in our interdisciplinary um, inquiry as to what's going on with our coastal zone um, and, and how things are working there. One of the tools that we've been using for several decades now is um, our, our public opinion polls, our surveys, survey instruments, face-to-face -face, uh, engagements, et cetera. Um, uh, Dan and Kiki are doing some great stuff now um, uh, uh, across the, our beaches. Um, and we'll be doing so for the next couple of years. But we also um, do this with our students and we also do this episodically when we have a disaster. This lady is filling out a survey during the 2015 refugio oil spill. Um, and these are really uh, helpful uh, uh, things that can tell us what's going on uh, with the beach. Importantly, even though the beach is super important financially, super important culturally, we don't have a lot of we, do, we don't have rich data sets that help us interpret and, and help us understand what's going on with these systems. So we've had to mostly create these systems ourselves, create these data sets ourselves. Um, and so for example, in the case of the refugio oil spill, um, uh, this is uh, the, the colors down below indicate areas that were, and, and so for those of you guys that are new and, or haven't, haven't, uh, weren't here when we had the spill, the spill happened uh, upwards uh, nor Northern Santa Barbara County basically. And, um, uh, for a whole variety of reasons, which, which aren't related to my sabbatical talk, but, but we can talk about later, um, the oil did not land on the beach in a traditional fashion. It went out to sea and then it came in and it dolloped here and there. So some of it landed in, in LA County, some of it landed on the uh, near campus here, all up and down. We didn't know what the oiling was like. So we had to create our own metrics and that's what we're showing here on the bottom. So on the bottom, the color, the hotter the color was an area that received more tarring, more oil on the beach. Um, and this is all from our students going out and, and, and basically hand collecting, hand monitoring this. But an example of the value of interdisciplinarity and the value of taking new, ins uh, new approaches to insights is right here. So in this case, we're looking at that a max tarring score on the beach on the, on the x-axis. And so we go from uh, no, no tar on the beach, on, on this particular beach, up to a lot of tar. And this is, this is data from 33 different beaches in our region. Um, and then on the left, on this case, this is how far people drove to get to the beach, right? So they've told us this. Um, they, today I, I came from Pacoima, today I came from Bakersfield, today I came from wherever. And so if we say, hey, how far did people drive to get, get to the beach? And how does that relate to how tarred the beach was? There's no significant difference. So people drove as far on average to get to a clean beach as they did to get to a dirty beach, which is kind of interesting. You might, you might have thought something else, maybe a dirty beach they wouldn't go to. In fact, they were going to the dirty beaches, but they were not staying at the dirty beaches. So this is um, uh, how much money these folks either spent in the past week or were intending to spend in the coming week if they just arrived at the beach. And what you see is um, beaches that are heavily tarred on the right, um, people did not spend much money. Right? So they came, they saw the tar and they left and they said, this, this, this is not my jam. And they, they went on. On, the, on the, the zeros and the ones, which were no or low tarred beaches, they hung out and they spent on average something about $200 uh, at the beach. So, so these types of inquiry are really helpful and really uh, insightful, but we have to do them ourselves. Okay, so uh, talk a little bit about, any questions so far about anything?
Directions to Oxnard College. Directions to Oxnard College. Uh, I would go, I would get in the car and hit Google and say, take me to Oxnard College. That's, that's my answer to that. One. <laughs> um, so, uh, that not for you, Dr. Anderson. The, what's that? That was not for you, Dr. Anderson. Oh, it's Sorry. okay, but, but I can roll with it. It's okay. I can, I mean, I can, I can use Google. I can go. <laughs> I can do that. Um, so, so, uh, Loretta, it sounds like Loretta's here. I some of my students here. So, about anything. so <laughs> so, so a lot of this data has been um, uh, collected by our student, my students like Loretta and, and all these folks. But so I talk with a little bit of insight and then we'll talk about what we found during COVID. So we do these public opinion polls, uh, Santa Barbara, LA, Ventura County. We typically survey every um, late summer, early fall, about a thousand to fifteen hundred people. And we ask them a series of questions, many of which are asked year to year, some of which wink on, wink off. Um, but um, it's a really valuable data set. Um, and we can ask things like this. So some of our questions are generic or, and more general. So um, do you think climate change is a serious problem? And then we ask some questions that are more coastal specific, beach specific. How old were you when you first went to a beach? Um, and, and things of that nature. And so because we've had this insight, we, um, we have some baseline for people's behavior. So when the pandemic came, we could start to say, hey, did the people behave the same way? Did some of their opinions change? Did their, their their appreciation change. Um, so this is uh, LA at the, you know, about a week or so after lockdown. And, you know, it's not Carmageddon. It's not, not Caltrans hasn't shut down the roads. This was, this is what we had um, in terms of uh, everybody staying home and everybody very scared. Um, and so uh, just, so let's look and see if people's, so let's just focus on this yes category here, which is, um, is climate change a serious problem? Um, which is a question we've been asking since 2005 or 2007, I think, I can't remember. And so what we found, what we found is 78% um, uh, said yes in 2016, 83% said yes in 2019, 89% said yes in 20, um, oh yeah, okay, in, in, uh, in 2020. So um, first, uh, Sometimes the rhetoric that we hear about people not believing in climate change, it's all BS. Uh, most, the vast majority of people do believe. It. It's a small subsection of folks that cause us these, these problems of denying, denying reality, et cetera. But, but we're seeing, in some cases, things intensify. In this case, do you think the health of the ocean is better now than in the 1950s? Um, and and there's, a, there's a large amount of error here. We have a large error in 2020 because we weren't able to sample as, as many people as we did. Um, but... Uh, but still relatively uh, similar amount when you take the error into. So, so those indicators didn't change so much or just got a little more intense. Because we've been asking what's been going on with the coast for some time, um, we can actually uh, uh, look at some of their, um, their behaviors, et cetera. So what we found over the years is that on average, most of the folks that we've encountered in, in Santa Barbara, Ventura, and Los Angeles County went to the beach uh, when they were on average 4.2 years old. But there's a huge variation. There's a huge variation. So some people went when they were, you know, six months old, et cetera. But the point is going to the beach um, for, doesn't matter what your economic income or whatever is, um, many of us go to the beach early on um, when we're young. 13%, and this is a number that really hasn't changed much over the years, 13% have avoided going to the beach because they feel unwelcomed. So they feel the people there don't look like them. They feel the, 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 the signage and, and what have you is, is intimidating. The point being that this is a public resource. Beaches in California are uh, open for everyone. Um, there are, there's no private ownership of a beach in California. You, you can't go onto the land right in front of a nuclear power plant or a military base. But aside from those things, you can go to the beach um, but yet uh, a significant number of our fellow citizens uh, feel unwelcome. And so that, that, that's a, a thing that we need to continue to address in the California inclusionary. On average, people seem to have driven a pretty good amount um, to get to the beach. Again, huge variation. So some people are going just a, a half mile or a mile or two or five miles or whatever, but we have a lot of folks that travel a great distance to come to the beach, to vacation coming from, from far away. Um, and so this is something that um, uh, Kiki and I and, and Dan and some of us are, are working on um, a much finer uh, 
granularity of data to, to look at this, but, but we're finding that. Um, and then we find that a lot of people go to the beach quite a lot. So um, right here, this is the number of folks that go to the beach daily, um, beach or coast. Now this could mean that they could drive by the beach. They're not necessarily touching the sand, but, but go to the immediate, immediate coastal zone. 6% per day, 22% per week, 30% per month. And then down here, I'm just summarizing, summing all those, right? So this, is, so this number here is, is 22 plus uh, six. So 28% go at least weekly. So a third of us go to the immediate coast, um, you know, at least once a week. Uh, uh, and on the order of more than half of us go to the coast or go by the coast, um, at least monthly and so on and so forth. So this is really powerful. So, the, so one thing we can start to ask with the pandemic is, did that change? Have people gone to the beach more um, now? And the answer is, um, it, it, it's, it's roughly about the same. So when we when we integrate over and this is this, this question 2020 we only asked for the, the past month so we we don't have data that goes uh, beyond a month but but it's it's similar right it's similar to what we have so even though we had lockdown and all this and that people were were um, were still attached to the beach people did not get uh, uh, scared off of going to their coastal zone to their shared heritage and we can talk about the other influences of COVID nineteen. Um, in terms of uh, going to the beach. So this is a classic photo. This is, uh, has become something of a classic photo, a meme. This was from Duval County in Florida. And this was beginning to show some of the fractures that, uh, and some of the uh, interesting stuff um, uh, going on with the pandemic. And so that was the county in, in the background did not restrict access to their beaches. Again, this is in Florida. The county in the foreground, and you can see some ATVs there, there's, there's some uh, law enforcement folks enforcing it. The county in front of us did ban going to the, uh, uh, prevented people from going to the beach, park lo parking lots, et cetera. And so you got get these strange um, geographic patterns where uh, up there there's a gazillion million people, down here there's no one. And uh, um, we, we had this ourselves, so uh, for any of you that are newly joining us or, or joined us after the pandemic or when the pandemic was already underway, um, there was a huge uh, stressful thing, which was we shut down access to our beaches in the early days and months of the pandemic, and this is an example of that uh, road closure um, on PCH. Um, and so we wrote an op-ed, and this was an op-ed that was written by several of us, some, se maybe several of you on, on the call right now, and we all wrote it together. It was great. Um, the, the thesis here was that um, not being able to go to the beach, not being able to utilize the beach is something of a um, crystal ball looking into the coming years, right? Where we have sea level rise and potential loss of these sandy beaches because of climate change in our and our, our poor management of these resources. And so this is sort of, uh, you know, giving you a, a little taste. And so we wrote what, what, what I think is a great op-ed. We got a lot of attention and people, and, and this caught a lot of people, uh, started a lot of people talking. Um, but after we submitted it, and after we'd gone through a couple drafts, LA Times said, you can only have three authors on the op-ed, which totally sucks. So, uh, so Claire and Emily and Stacy and all these other uh, wonderful colleagues that helped write this, um, they didn't get their names on it, which was lame. But um, but this is absolutely an example of the the productivity of, of interdisciplinary collaboration during the, the pandemic uh, and, and on a sabbatical. Um, so uh, happy to share this if you guys are curious about this um, about this op ed. Um, and then um, we can talk about uh, other sources of data. So so we'll talk about some of the, the survey data in a second. But we can also there was other data sources that we collected that I collected, again, starting on my sabbatical and then continuing on to this day, which is how are people, how, how elastic is the demand for beaches? So is it people just like, oh, beaches are nice when it's hot and warm and whatever, or are people really attached and do they just need to have their beach fixed no matter what? And so that's what we're showing here. So this is a map of PCH, basically from campus, from CSUCI, from Las Posas, down to, um, uh, down to Gelson's and, or not Gelson's, not to, down to Gladstone's on Sunset Boulevard. So from uh, Ventura County down into Los Angeles. Las Posas Road, the road basically from campus is zero miles. And this is the mileage as you drive south into 
Los Angeles. So Sunset Boulevard is right here. Uh, this, this color represents the break between uh, the two counties. Um, and, so, uh, and so this is me driving down the coast, counting how many folks are parked at um, different distances, different parking lots, different, different uh, areas on the shoulder of the road. And this is all relative to before the COVID. Um, so these are relative numbers. Uh, each of the site was how many cars typically park in this area. And then, um, and then when the pandemic started, it was what was that change that we saw? And so here we go. So let's start with looking at one here. This was just when the closure was just starting out. And initially, I only th th that first day, I only surveyed down a little bit into LA. And then after that, started surveying deeper, deeper into LA. Uh, anyway, so as we see here, as we go into how many days of the closure, um, first people are kind of parking where they're parking and people are going, there's some enhanced going to the beach. And then LA County basically shut da shuts down its um, beaches and we start to see this, this growth over here. So now Ventura County, which was had not closed its beaches at that point, huge growth. Everybody um, that was wanting to go to the beach, and we also, in a lot of these areas in LA, if you look, um, went negative. So there's many fewer people that were parking there than historically were parking there. But um, we have this huge pulse in Ventura, and indeed we've seen this, uh, we've, we've seen this um, uh, continue on. So it looks like, looks like my time is getting on and I'm, I'm rambling uh, too long. So I'll, I'll pick up the pace a little bit here, but suffice it to say um, uh, when, uh, and so that happened, people got shoved over to Ventura. When we shut down all the coast, people went up in the hills. And then when we relaxed and allowed people to go back to the beach, what we're seeing is increased parking on the beach. So, so just like you can imagine a, a, a water balloon, when we, when we wouldn't allow people to park in one area and we squeezed it, the demand expanded elsewhere. But now that we've um, left all of these restrictions and people can park wherever they want, go wherever they want, visit whatever part of the beach they want, now it looks like there's increased demand and people have, people have um, either uh, gone to a new place or they had not gone to the beach very often. They went, they discovered it was awesome and they want to go more. So we're seeing increased demand. And even when we try to shut down that demand, um, people really uh, still, still want to get their jam on. They still want to get their beach on. Um, this is a project that um, uh, Dan has spearheaded, um, but uh, Dan and Kiki and I uh, uh, have been doing this with some students. And this is looking at how um, closures and how people responded to closures around the country in, in all the different coastal counties around the US during COVID. And so this is just one example of that, which is compliance. So, so when people had a, a, a rule about social distancing and everybody still has, most people still have rules about social distancing or mask wearing or what have you, early on in the pandemic, people were very, um, were very uh, 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 tr uh, compliant and were following the rules and doing all that kind of stuff. As we went through, as we all experienced fatigue, they, they, they dropped down and, um, and they weren't as um, attentive to rules. Um, but nevertheless, uh, we still have uh, our most recent data point, which was um, this past winter, um, you know, on about, about 30% of the folks on average, uh, or 30% of the counties on average report, um, you know, pretty decent compliance in terms of stuff. So, so people are getting attached to the beaches when they come to the beach and they see there's no real, um, you know, early on, they're very afraid. And so they're, they're staying away and they're following the rules strictly. But now as they've been experiencing this resource, they've sort of decided that, well, you know, um, I don't have to be as socially distant or what have you. So, so um, and, and there's all kinds of other aspects that we can talk about, but um, my time is going on. We also ask those same folks, we also ask those um, county uh, 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 representatives, managers of the coast, um, how has interest in beaches changed? And 75% of the people of the counties we've talked to say clearly there's increased interest in the beach. They're getting more people wanting to park. They're getting more people wanting to um, uh, uh, utilize the beach, asking questions about when gates are opened and things of that nature. And so again, um, huge demand in the pandemic has really only, if anything, only heightened people's interest and desire for this resource. Um, um, yeah, so time-wise is going on. I'm getting near the end of my time, but I'll say that um, uh, this is from our uh, fall surveys about um, why did you choose to go to the beach or, or what were factors that were influencing your, um, your, your 
desire to go to the beach or your behavior going to the beach. And so these are the, the categories here, but then they're summed up here. So about 42% of the folks, um, the pandemic had a direct influence on their, uh, on their beach attendance. Um, and then the rest are other things that you typically would think of, things like hot weather, environmental conditions, things like wanting to have, um, you know, clear my mind, uh, recharge my soul, things of that nature. And only if only a, a small fraction have to do with the distances that people travel. So these other factors seem to be more important uh, in aggregate than, um, than some of the transportation issues or some of the, some of the other ones. Transportation is a real challenge. Um, um, feeling unsafe is a real challenge, but, but by and large, those are relatively minor compared to people's desire to get there. We've also looked at how people's behaviors changed in the pandemic. In this case, this is how um, people's uh, food, uh, eating uh, patterns changed. And so if people were e reported eating the same amount of these, these food items as they did um, at, before the pandemic, it would, be, it would be here at Unity, it would be zero. So, you know, shocker, not a whole lot more fruit was being eaten. Not a whole lot more vegetables were being eaten in the pandemic, right? And as we go up, these are things that uh, that um, uh, grew as we as we um, uh, went in the pandemic. And so, so shellfish uh, and fish, which are two things that we're particularly interested in, grew a lot. Soda grew a lot as well. But but interesting, seafood was one of the the clear um, winners in terms of um, uh, things that people desired more during uh, lockdown. Also, as a consequence, people were using more plastic. And so this is another, um, we do a lot with microplastics in our, in our department um, and, and plastic waste in general. Uh, Claire Steele has some great long-term work with uh, Russ Bradley and, and the folks out on the research station um, looking at primarily macroscopic uh, marine debris and, and trash on beaches and coastlines. Um, but we also look at, at microplastics. Um, and in this case, uh, so this is much more and more, but, but about half of our respondents report that they're using more plastic, only about a fifth report using less plastic. So this is, um, appears to be being driven by some follow-up questions, appears to be being driven by the use of, um, uh, of food containers uh, and the like, and, and having to purchase, having to put things in bags when we go to the store, as opposed to using a, dispo a reusable bag, things of that nature. Uh, um, okay, so then the last thing I'm just going to finish, or two, two last things, and I'll let everybody go. Um, and that is uh, one thing I'm really proud of that we've been working on since 2014, but um, under the leadership of my great colleague, Kiki Patch, we finally got the first paper published. Um, but that is uh, another example of this interdisciplinary approach to thinking about the beach, which is um, uh, trying to figure out how healthy, what is the state of our beaches uh, broadly writ, um, of our beach, beach system broadly writ. Um, and uh, for this, we've developed we've developed an approach that uses some high tech things, some drones and things of that nature, but combines um, aspects of the physical environment, aspects of the biological or ecological environment, and socioeconomic valuation. And so, since about a time, I'm not going to talk a whole lot about this, but um, we've been doing this for several years. We've been refining it. We use drones to measure the shapes of our beaches. Um, many of our students, probably many of you on the on on um, our, our seminar here, our, our webinar, um, have contributed to this. So it's great. This particular paper, which is published and out now, if you guys are curious, uh, looks at just a subset of our beaches. We actually sample more than 40 uh, overall, but, but these are our sort of long-term, um, some long-term focal beaches. And we create different component grades for these beaches and then an overall grade for how well they're functioning. Um, in this particular paper, we, we looked at the current conditions in 2019, the year that I was on we get some scores here. You can look at your favorite beach. You can, we can show them uh, maybe in a more attractive map form. But uh, then we simulated a, a one meter rise in sea level rise plus um, a, a relatively big storm that might bring in some, some storm surge. And so you're seeing that visualized here where, where the water level is now a little bit high and it's sort of encroaching on, for example, these homes in these areas. Um, I should say that one meter sea level rise is sort of the, the white lab rat when we talk about sea level rise. Um, it's totally almost assuredly wrong. So the, the most recent guidance from the Coastal Commission to other state agencies is we should be modeling a you know, seven to eight foot rise in sea level. And there's many models from Scripps and elsewhere that shows that seven to eight foot rise in sea level is, is, is too low. But, but just to have something new, that's what we did. And we, we run our models um, 
and uh, make some simple assumptions. And um, turns out that uh, uh, under even this moderate sea level rise condition, our beach, our beach health, our overall condition, the score they get uh, goes in the toilet is the short answer. So we had, you know, Bs and Cs primarily. Now we're mostly seeing Cs and Ds under this situation. Um, and, uh, and, and, and so we can use these, these, these tools um, to really better engage with the general public, with managers. We can ask what if questions. We can look at the effect of different management in a manner, you know, with simple grades, letter grades, dashboard types of approaches that are much easier for the general public and, and our folks that aren't, uh, you know, totally ensconced in the technical nuances of beach crab biology, um, you know, the condition of the beach and the conditions of the beaches. Um, the last thing I'll just mention that we're just working on, and, and this is, I'm really excited. I was hoping to have some data to, to, to show for you guys, um, but we, we've not really got into the data yet. But this is a, a project um, um, uh, really spearheaded by our colleagues at Beacon. Beacon is a, is a joint powers authority um, uh, in, from Santa Barbara down to us that helps manage uh, uh, sand resources, coastal resources, um, includes counties, includes cities, includes a whole variety of folks. And um, along with some other agencies, um, we were able to pull together some money and start to get cell phone data. So we're now in the process of having this and um, we are able to take our point counts of people's attending beaches and things of that nature. And we can actually use the data that are coming off of your phones. These are, this is data that's been pulled together, scraped by third-party data brokers, uh, anonymized. So we don't know people's names, but we know uh, their demographics. We know their, their um, uh, place of origin. So their zip codes, things of that nature. And historically, this data, historically, it's only been around for a few years, but, but traditionally this data is used by the person that wants to put a store in the mall and they want to know, hey, what's the traffic you know, what's the income of people that come by this particular geography or something of that nature? We're using it to see what numerically, quantitatively changed with beach visitation during the COVID pandemic. And so this is one of those things where it's super interesting from a scientific point of view, from a research point of view, from a citizen point of view, it's super creepy, right? It's like, oh my God, these folks are, our cell phones are telling people where we are and and, and all that. So, so we don't have anything to share, share with you yet, but, but in the coming weeks and months, we envision this to be a huge uh, boon for understanding who's using the coast. Um, uh, is it folks from East LA? Is it folks from Simi Valley? Is it folks from downtown Santa Barbara? Who's using the beach? Um, and uh, uh, what's their educational attainment? Um, are they, do they seem like they're getting to the beach um, with cars or with buses or what have you? So, so really neat stuff piloting this here, but if this works, we hope to maybe apply this across the California coast to look at um, utilization of this key resource um, across our region. So again, in summary, I'll just say that beaches are really ecologically and socially energetic places. They have a value, um, uh, they, they have huge value, but oftentimes we have to show that. We have to collect data ourselves because there aren't large data repositories, but interdisciplinary approaches, sometimes using animals, sometimes using cell phone data, sometimes using public opinion polling data, sometimes using whatever. That's really the key to really understand these very important systems. COVID-19 seems to have been a really, um, on top of everything else, a really interesting, so, you know, quote unquote, natural experiment, and, and in some ways, perhaps a forecast for our future, and that this whole suite of tools we've been developing are really powerful, and we'd love to develop even more tools and make them more complex and more nuanced if you guys are interested in, in uh, collaborating. That could be... Uh, that could be uh, philosophically, that could be uh, uh, rhetorically, that could be numerically, but um, this really is, I think, one of the, the, the hallmarks of our program and our campus, and we love to have even more colleagues um, engage with us. So with that, I will be quiet and ask again if you guys have any questions. Yeah, uh, so Blake, go for it. Hey, that was cool, thank you. Um, I, I, I was intrigued by your slide where you started to explore people feeling welcome or unwelcome at the beach. And yeah. I live in a pretty segregated community. Um, and I'm just wondering if you, if you did, if you think about the demographics of the, of that, of those feelings at all. Yeah. Yes. It's a great point. So, um, where we saw this, so where this really started to spike or where, where we really started to ask this was, um, uh, 
uh, let me let me just um, let me let's see how do I um, hold on a second. Let me do this and let me do stop recording. <laughs> <laughs>